All right. Well, as I said, um, welcome today. Today we're going to talk about the environmental benefits of reuse and quantifying the environmental impacts of new versus reused and retrofitted existing buildings. This is a difficult and um, somewhat controversial task. And that's what we are going to be covering today. And before I introduce our moderator, I wanted to mention that we will be taking questions um, at the end of the presentation. But if you have a question at any point, please uh, write your question. It, it will be under um, the login um, box, the, um, the screen that you have up. Um, just write in the questions. You can send it privately to the organizer. That's me. And then at the end of the presentation, we will um, ask our speakers um, the questions. So um, now to get started, I want to introduce our um, moderator. And that is Burton Peak Edwards. He's AIA Lead LP. AP, excuse me. Uh, Burton is the project principal for Siegel and Strain Historic Projects. He has been project manager and preservation architect for commercial, institutional, and historic projects throughout California. Burton's previous experience includes heading up his own firm specializing in residential and historic preservation. His projects have won awards from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the California Preservation Foundation, Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association, the Oakland Heritage Alliance, and the San Francisco AIA. He's served as chair on the City of Berkeley Landmarks Preservation Commission and Berkeley's Design Review Committee. He's also co-founded and serves as president of the Building Conservancy of Northern California, a nonprofit dedicated to the preservation and restoration of historic properties, and a recent grant recipient from the University's Chancellor's Community Partnership Fund. So with that, I will hand it over to um, Burton. Okay, um, thank you, Corinne. Sure. Uh, you hear these introductions and you sometimes forget the, uh, the things you've done. Um, <clears throat> my job here is a really sort of a simple one. I uh, was moderator at the conference in Santa Monica, and here I'll be serving to introduce our uh, two panelists, uh, Larry Strain and Ralph Dinoa. And I believe we've arranged it so at the end, um, in, in this instance, Corinne is actually going to uh, serve as moderator for the questions, but I may be available to help sort of direct questions as appropriate. And she's already mentioned that um, uh, participants in the webinar should be uh, prepared to email in any questions they have during the course of this. So without um, further ado, I've got uh, a brief introduction now for Larry Strain, and then I'll um, hold my intro for Ralph Dinola uh, until just before he speaks. Um, so Larry Strain um, is uh, an architect, a fellow of the AIA, also a lead AP. Uh, he was a founding principal of Siegel and Strain Architects here in Emeryville, uh, where he's a fellow principal, or I am a fellow principal of his. Uh, in the past decade, Siegel and Strain has received more than 60 awards for design, historic preservation, and sustainable design, including four of the AIA Code or Committee on the Environment Top 10 awards. Uh, Larry serves as principal in charge for many of Siegel and Strain's sustainable projects, uh, including the Portola Valley Town Center, which is a project he'll be showing during uh, his portion of the presentation. Uh, he was also author of the groundbreaking publication, Resourceful Specifications, which was the 1998 winner of the AIA Award for Practice and Technology. His more recent research uh, has focused on net zero building and carbon sequestration, which will be some of the topics he'll be covering during this presentation. 
Okay. Thank you. This is Larry Strain. Welcome. Uh, so the way we've broken this down is even I'm going to sort of focus on uh, em embodied carbon and carbon impacts of embodied new buildings, sort of understand what that's about, and then Ralph will be talking about what they've learned about the value of existing buildings and saving those. So I'm going to talk about embodied carbon, which is the CO2 or emissions or CO2 equivalents we talk about that are attributable to the materials and construction of our buildings, and then the relationship of that embodied carbon to operating carbon. And the premise of this talk really is that embodied carbon is more important than we thought it was. Next slide. Are you doing, oh, there we go. Uh, there we go. So usually when we've talked about uh, carbon impacts or building impacts, environmental impacts from buildings, uh, we focus on building operations, which is understandable. Um, uh, the CO2 emissions uh, is, is very large for embodied, for our operating buildings. Uh, a lot of energy impacts, a lot of electricity, 12% uh, of the water, 38% of all our CO2 emissions are directly attributable to buildings. So that's a pretty large number. Next slide. But the thing we, we want to pay attention to also is that construction is also a large impact. Uh, so it's, it's about 12% of the CO2 emissions are from building our buildings. Um, a lot of waste comes from them. Uh, a lot of the global wood harvest goes into our buildings. Uh, and it's, it's a very large impact. Next slide. So if you look at those two numbers, 38% of CO2 emissions from operating and 12% for building them, it looks like operating's uh, a lot more, a lot bigger impact. But if you go to the next slide, the, the thing to remember about this is that operating emissions are for all our buildings that are already built. That's 300 plus billion square feet of buildings account for that much. The 10, the 12% happens from the, what we build each year. Uh, so, on a per square foot basis, construction is a higher number. So the sources of CO2 emissions are uh, from the materials themselves, extraction, harvest, manufacture, and transport of those materials, and then the construction activities, which is, you know, the, the equipment and labor, energy use during construction. Uh, and though that can be a large number, the largest impact typically is in the materials that go into our buildings for embodied embodied or construction sources of CO2. Next slide. So this slide really looks at, uh, takes it down to a single building. This is a small home, and on the left side are all the materials that go into making that home. And it's a lot of materials to make one home. On the right side are some of the impacts from those materials. So those top three uh, items on the left side, the lumber and wood, is about a quarter acre of forest to build one small home and about four tons of CO2 emissions. Uh, the shingles, the asphalt shingles, is an oil-based product, so there's a lot of uh, impact there from just using that amount of oil. The 55 yards of concrete is 10 tons of CO2 emissions for this one house. Uh, fiberglass insulation typically uh, has, fire, has formaldehyde in it, and fiberglass itself is probably a carcinogen. The 300 pounds of nail is 600 pounds of emission, so there's more weight going up the stack than it's actually in the nail itself. Um, copper has huge impacts from open pit mining pollution. Uh, 55 gallons of paint is about 100 pounds of volatile organic compounds into the atmosphere, and then something like 5 to 10 pounds of solid waste per square foot of building. The next. next slide. Okay. So, um, so how do we lower those impacts? Um, this, this is a list of the criteria that I've used since the mid-90s when we wrote that resourceful specification on so sort of what makes a material green. What are the uh, criteria that we use to select greener materials? And it's a pretty standard list. It's you know, durable means it lasts longer, renewable, uh, biodegradable, efficient, all those things are, are pretty standard. But what happens if we look at the same list and think about what makes a low embodied, inner, embodied CO2 material? 
the next slide. And it turns out that the list doesn't really change. Uh, most of those things that were important for just environmental impacts are also important for lowering CO2. So durable means lower life cycle CO2 because the material lasts longer. Renewable means you're sequestering, you're, you're sequestering CO2 in some of those renewable resources. Efficient, you're doing more with less CO2 emissions. So it goes right down the list. So we really don't have to change our criteria to select lower embodied uh, energy or or carbon materials. Next slide. And the thing to keep in mind, I think, is that there there isn't going to be a perfect material, and there's always going to be trade-off. So low embodied carbon is important, but it's not always going to be the most important environmental impact uh, that you're considering. And the, the the environmental impacts you consider when you're selecting materials are going to shift depending on application and things like that. So next slide, please. So this slide is, is from a study that the National Association of Home Builders did, and they used the Athena Impact Estimator to calculate embodied CO2 emissions for a typical suburban home in Los Angeles. Uh, the typical home included such great products as vinyl windows and vinyl siding. And the study also listed um, carbon emissions for alternate materials. So they had a list of alternate materials that you could select and, and uh, play with their, their building. Um, so the typical home was about 50, slightly over 50 tons of embodied CO2 equivalents in that, to build that home. So I went through their list and selected materials that I thought were greener. Um, and uh, so I substituted cellulose insulation for fiberglass and wood frame windows for vinyl frame windows and wood siding for vinyl siding. I even selected some materials that actually had higher embodied carbon impacts. Uh, the steel roofing over the comp shingle because it's more durable and 2x6 framing over 2x4 because you can get more insulation in the walls. And out of all that, we, we had about a 7.5 ton reduction by just selecting, by substituting those materials for our typical home. But the interesting thing about this slide for me is this house was designed in, in Los Angeles with a full basement. And I don't know if you know Los Angeles, but there are no basements in Los Angeles. So they're slab on grade projects mostly. So if you eliminate the basement, you take out almost 20 tons of CO2. So the point of this slide is to say that you can get part of the way there by selecting greener, lower embodied carbon materials. And the rest of it, but even more importantly, is to try and eliminate materials, try and eliminate uh, the, the materials you need in a home. Next slide. And this next, uh, this next slide just shows, if you look at the material down the left-hand side and then sort of a standard or virgin material in the first couple of columns over, uh, and you end up with tons of CO2 per ton of material in that column next to the standard mix in the fiberglass, the polystyrene. Then if you look at alternates, this just gives you an idea of the range of uh, reduction by picking up a, a lower embodied carbon material. So the concrete, you can cut it roughly in half, 40, 45%. Cellulose, you can cut uh, a lot over fiberglass. And it gives you the savings. Uh, and then on the far right are the sources. And I'll go, uh, I can answer those questions at the end about where the sources are for this this kind of data. Next slide. So that's some background for and some context for the project that I'm really going to talk about, which is a project we designed with Boring and Straja Architects. It was finished in 2009 and it was a LEED Platinum uh, Town Center. It's also an AA Top 10 project. And it was designed to be very low energy, and we had a conscious effort to use low impact, low carbon materials. But when we started the project, we weren't really measuring that impact. We were just making the best choices we could based on those criteria I showed you earlier. And what we decided to do after the project was built was go back and calculate the entire project as a baseline project and then as the project we actually built. Um, so these are... Uh, Wood frame buildings, they're, they have slab, concrete slabs, so they're slab on grade. They're clad in wood. They have wood paneling, wood ceilings, and the total square footage for all the complex of buildings is about 23,000 square feet. Uh, next slide. 
so the reason we, we did this project, and this, is, this will tie into what Ralph's going to talk about, because what you'll find there is that really it's better not to tear down old buildings. The, the, the image on your left was an old, the old buildings that were uh, school buildings that the town had been using as their town center for about 30 years. And the reason they got these school buildings and they got them so cheaply is that the San Andreas Fault runs right under those buildings. And so the town at, at some point decided that they really couldn't, uh, in conscience, stay in those buildings any longer. They were too dangerous. There was no way to retrofit a building that sits on top of a fault, not next to a fault, but astride the fault. So we came up with this uh, design that moved the buildings out of the fault zone. It's still going to be a heavy ground shaking, ground movement area, but it won't be split apart. And in, in, in doing so, we also managed to reduce the amount of paving, reduce the amount of building footprint, increase the amount of landscape and, pave, and playing fields. And so we tried to, in our new design, uh, mitigate some of the impacts by just building less and making more green space. Next slide. Uh, the other thing we did was we took all the materials out of those old buildings and uh, almost none of it left the site. So we reclaimed a lot of the wood, over 20,000 board feet was reclaimed and reused in the new project. We also recycled all of the concrete, all of the asphalt paving and all of the CMU was used on site for uh, base rock, for winterization, trail maintenance. And then some of the projects, some of the materials were taken off-site and recycled also. So all of the metal and uh, pipe and rebar was taken off-site and recycled. In all in all, about by weight, about 95% of the materials were recycled uh, or reused on, on site. Next, next slide. And this is, this is a view of the interior of one of those projects showing a lot of those recycled, reclaimed materials. So the ceiling, the wood slat ceiling is all wood that was uh, uh, reclaimed and then remilled as an acoustic ceiling uh, panel. And the wall on the right that's wood paneling is also from the buildings. And even the window trim, uh, we ran out of reclaimed wood. We specified all reclaimed wood for interiors. We ran out of it, and the contractor took the, the wood crates that the metal roofing had been shipped in and remilled it into window trim. So he actually was recycling construction waste coming onto the project and we're using it. And the, the column is a tree that had to come out as part of the project that we use as a column inside. Uh, even the flooring is not typically a recycled product, but it's eucalyptus flooring, which is a tree that cleared and chipped and thrown away because there's no viable use for it. And these were trees that were cut down about five miles away from the site for fire reasons and reused as eucalyptus flooring. Next slide. So the first thing, uh, if you want to calculate the carbon emissions, uh, the embodied carbon in a building and the emissions that are attributable to building that, the first thing you have to do with materials is figure out how much everything weighs. Um, so we, we took all of our uh, material takeoff uh, from our cost estimate and, and converted all of the units into weight. And so you can see that even that uh, the weight of these buildings is primarily concrete. The blue band is concrete, uh, which, is, which is sort of interesting because uh, they're actually, they, they look and feel like wood buildings. Uh, but concrete turns out uh, weighs a lot. Next, next slide. And you'll see. Uh, that this is what this is what the buildings look like, and they really they really feel like wood buildings, but they really, if you look at it by volume and by by weight, they're concrete buildings uh, primarily. So next slide, please. So then the next thing you have to do is convert all those materials. Now go back one, please. Uh, I went too far. Come back. Yeah, go back one, please. So all those materials uh, get converted then to tons of emissions. So each material has a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions that it emits per, per unit of weight. So there's about 450 tons of greenhouse gas emissions from all of those materials. And again, concrete's still the largest band, but it's by no means three-quarters anymore. So concrete isn't that it's such a high 
emitting material, it's that it weighs so much and we use so much of it in our building. So that's the thing to remember. It's still by far the largest sing single piece, uh, but it doesn't correlate to that 30, about 75 percent of, of the material by weight. Um, so we, we just added up all the things, and I'll tell you how we arrived at those numbers a little later in the presentation. Next slide. So the next few slides are going to look at, at the baseline and then the as-built case. So the orange, the orange bars are the baseline. These numbers don't quite correlate. You saw it was 428, now it's 431, but anyway, it's about 440, 50 pounds, tons for the base case. Um, and we divided it into the structure, the envelope, the finishes, and the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing uh, pieces of the project. So the base case is about 430 plus tons of emissions, and the as-built is about uh, 300 tons. Um, the largest, um, so the largest portion is in the concrete, the largest reduction and the largest portion is in the concrete, which is the far left-hand bar. Uh, so the base case concrete was about 240 tons, and our reduced carbon concrete, which is essentially a high slag, high fly ash mix, or replaced over 50 percent, about 50 percent of the cement was replaced by slag and some fly ash. Uh, we reduced that um, quite a lot. Um, there are other reductions. The other reduction, that one little blue bar that goes down, the minus number, uh, that's the salvaged wood. And the, the, the the theory behind that is that uh, by using 20,000 board feet of salvaged wood, all of the trees that we would have had to cut down to make up that lumber are still standing, still sequestering carbon. So actually the salvaged wood is, is a negative balance in this, in this equation. But the largest ones come in your structure, uh, and you've got a pretty large one in finishes because of that negative um, uh, for the salvaged wood. So it's a pretty big reduction, about a 32% reduction by selecting uh, lower carbon materials. Next slide. But it turns out uh, that the buildings aren't the whole story. Um, when you add in all the site materials, which is that box on the left, same numbers on the right, uh, the number in the base case goes up to 750 tons of embodied emissions, and the as-built 50, 550 tons. So it's the overall reduction is slightly less by percentage, but um, it's still a large amount. And again, the, the largest single reduction in the site is, again, from site concrete. Uh, the, the slight reduction in, in AC paving on the far left is actually because we managed to use less AC paving. We, we narrowed the road width. We, we got rid of the shoulders and made them gravel shoulders, and we reduced about 10% of our uh, paving, about 5% of our paving. Um, and we also, in the middle of that site one, there's a thing called trail paving, which actually we used a resin-based paving instead of asphalt. So that was a lower carbon footprint than the asphalt paving. But you can see that this number for this whole project, when you bring in the site, is climbing. Now we're up to 750 tons for the base case. Next slide. And finally, what we looked at last was the construction vehicle emissions. Now, go back one, please, yep. and then I'll go to this next one. Sure. There we go. Uh, so this is a lot of the emissions in, in transportation are already built into the materials. So the emissions that, that are for the materials, getting them to the, from harvesting them to manufacturing them, getting them to the, the you know, lumber yard is all built into the material numbers. But the final numbers of getting it from the lumber yard to our site or all the other numbers that, uh, that are directly attributable to our project, it's another 300 tons um, for the base case and almost as much. So in this case, the, the huge number on the left is, is a number, it's the one number that we didn't calculate. And this number is, comes from the Environmental Protection Agency has a, a calculator that they published in a study that basically says if you don't know what your emissions are from all your site work and your grading and your paving uh, equipment, you can use this, this number, um, which is about uh, 0.36 tons of CO2 per $1,000 worth of site work, which sounds like a lot, 
but I've talked to a number of people and they think it might actually be low. We had about $400,000 worth of site work. So there's about 140 tons of, of emissions from the vehicles used to do all the earthwork. Now keep in mind this is an 11 acre site um, and there was a lot of work. We tore up a lot of paving, we regraded things. Um, so it's not a typical uh, site, but the thing to remember I think is that any site, even a small urban site, has site work, uh, site work that happens on that project and often those numbers don't get counted when you're counting up uh, emissions for a project. So the next slide goes into a little detail of how we calculated this and really we just, we just looked at uh, the distance uh, from the site where the material is coming from, the number of trips it took, the total miles, miles per gallon, that gave us gallons of gas and then we multiply that by a CO2 per pound per gallon and we come up with tons of CO2. Uh, the interesting thing about this, there's that top bar which is the, the one we didn't calculate which is the EPA estimate which is by far the largest amount. But the other ones that I've circled here are the windows. Uh, the windows are a, a very nice wood window uh, that's FSC certified. It comes out of Canada. And the windows had to arrive on three different trucks all the way from Canada because, um, because of the way the contractor wanted to order them. And it's a huge number. It's the second, well, it's the third biggest number in this, on this line item, 30 tons of CO2. Uh, so I think that one of the things you learn is not just the distance, but how it's going to be transported. Those couldn't come by train because apparently the glass breaks if you try and shoot by truck always. And the other thing that was large was the work from the site for 17 months was about 50 tons of carbon. Over 300 tons of carbon for uh, the base case and a little under for the amount we saved. The amount we saved was really that we salvaged um, the wood and concrete and things we salvaged on site and used as base rock and, and wood uh, didn't have to be trucked in from somewhere else. So it was about 16 tons of carbon we were able to save by using site, site salvaged and site reused materials. So it's something, but it's not a huge amount. So next, next slide, please. So here's the total. The, the total uh, base case is just over 1,000 tons and the as-built was a, a close to 850 tons, about a 20% savings. Um, so that was, and that was with counting it after we built the building. If we could have uh, uh, tried this before we built, we might have been able to uh, select some materials that were lower than the ones that we ended up selecting. But it shows the kinds of reductions that are readily achievable uh, in a project. Uh, next slide, please. And I think this next one just breaks it down a little further. If you just take the buildings, we had about a 32% reduction in buildings plus site. The smaller reduction in site building in vehicles is 20%. But it gives the total ton uh, that we ended up with in each case. Next slide. So this next slide really talks about um, how we calculate this. Um, We have the next one. Sorry. So this just shows uh, every material. We we have the weight. We have the number of tons of CO2 per ton of material. And these numbers, uh, most of these numbers come from this source called uh, the ICE database, which is the um, Inventory of Carbon and Energy database out of Bath, England. Uh, and it's it's not local, but it's still the best source that I've seen where you can look at it on a material by material basis. And they even talk about their assumptions, they talk about recycled content and different mixes. So it's a pretty detailed uh, mix and I've checked what I can against the sources we have in this country and they're, they're fairly consistent. If anything, they're probably a little higher because England is a slightly higher uh, coal-based economy than we are. So. Um, Anyway, that's where the numbers come from. And then you just plug in the alternate numbers for a reduced, con a, a concrete mix, for instance, with a reduced um, cement uh, content, and, uh, and you get the reductions like that. The next slide, this, that just shows the structure. The next slide shows you the whole project, and you can see that 
you break it down by structure, envelope, finishes, and mechanical electrical plumbing, the largest chunk is the structure, which is typically true for buildings, although some office buildings and high-rise buildings, the envelope with, uh, say, uh, aluminum and glass uh, skin might make that as high as the structure. Uh, but you can tell sort of where things break down, and it shows all the all the red numbers are numbers that we reduced. At the very bottom, you can see pounds of CO2 per square foot. So our base case was 37 pounds of CO2 per square foot, and our reduced case was 25 pounds per square foot. And this is for the project you just saw, which was essentially a wood. A wood. Next slide is the same analysis we did for another one of our which is the Rinda Town Hall. It's going to come up in a minute. It's going to look just the same. Yeah. But if you go down to the very bottom, this, this is a mixed structural system. So it's got steel frames and wood framing and a huge reach concrete chaining wall dug into a hillside. The total uh, pounds per square foot for the baseline is 74 pounds, and reduced carbon is 57. And this is going to be more typical for a commercial building. The first one, even though it was a commercial project, really was uh, almost residential in scale and materials. Uh, a lot of wood, uh, wood windows, things that you don't often use in a uh, commercial project. So these numbers on a pound per square foot are more in line with what uh, I've seen from other studies I've read about pounds per square foot for embodied carbon. Next slide. So what we learned by all this uh, was a couple of things. One is you tackle the high volume materials first. So concrete, it's not that concrete is such a high emission material it's that we use a lot of it. So tackle the big, the big ticket items first. So the structural items, uh, the cladding items. Where we use it. So if you just go through a cost estimate and look at the ones that have the most material in them, try and focus on those. You want to avoid really energy intensive high carbon materials. Um, expanded polystyrene insulation, even though uh, we didn't use very much of it, it emitted 28 tons of CO2. So that was a number that we didn't focus on this project, which we will focus on in the next project. Salvaged and recycled materials actually make a big difference. Uh, we saved about 34 tons of CO2 by using reclaimed and recycled and salvaged wood. Uh, distance does matter. So we saved about 16 tons by salvaging materials on site and reusing them. And the, the windows that came from Canada, we spent 30 tons. So distance does matter, especially if you're traveling by truck. And then the site work matters. Uh, if you have a large site, um, you're going to, and you've got very inefficient equipment, usually grading your site and paving your site, uh, it emits a lot of emissions. So those were the big, the big lessons learned on embodied carbon. Next slide. And the last thing I want to do is cover uh, the construction versus operating emissions. So these, these buildings, first of all, are, are very efficient buildings. Uh, they use a lot of passive techniques and very efficient systems. And uh, they, they were modeled to beat Title 24 by, by, by close to 50%, uh, if you include the photovoltaic system in there. Um, and they're actually doing better than that. Uh, the photovoltaic system was supposed to supply 25% of the power, and it's currently providing 75% of the power for this project. So we did a lot of things on the operational end uh, on this project. So next slide. So this is how embodied emissions and operating emissions are typically compared. You look at uh, the blue line is the construction uh, emissions, the construction embodied emissions. And the reason it rises from 430 tons up to 700 tons is that over a 100-year lifespan, you're maintaining the building. You're replacing things. You're working on it. So some estimates say that number approximately doubles in 100 years. Uh, we use a slightly lower factor. But every 20 or 30 years, there's a little jump in the line that you do some more work for the building. So if you look at it this way, and the operating energy is the red line that just keeps going up, the more you're emitting carbon over time. And this is the standard base case building. So construction uh, looks like it's about 8% of operating energy uh, in this case. Construction emissions are 8% of operating emissions. 
So next slide. The, the next slide looks at our project <laughs> like that. Um, and, and then you can see everything drops. Uh, both the operating emission drops, but the construction uh, emissions dropped as well. So we're still about only 11% of construction to operating, if you look at it this way. And this is why I think people have ignored um, construction emissions for so long, is that it seems like it's a pretty small number and let's focus on operating. But here's why I think that's not true. The next slide. If you look at this same chart, and you don't consider the life of the building, you consider the next 20 to 25 years, uh, it changes it completely. So this, the next slide will blow that up. That little box in the left-hand corner will blow it up so we can see it better. And the reason that I think it's important to think about the next 20, 20 years is that uh, for, for the climate the crisis we're facing with, with carbon in the atmosphere, we don't have 100 years to solve that problem. We have maybe 20 years. And if you look at the 2030 challenge and all the other things that are out there, that's what they're all targeting, is that we need to be way better within 20 years. So if you look at a 20-year time frame, time frame uh, construction emission, this is back, back to the base. Is this the base one? Uh, yeah, I think that may be wrong. Nevertheless, uh, it, it's about 30% 30, 30 of the total emissions uh, are from construction. So instead of it being 10% or less, it's a third of your emissions. And it may even be higher. If you look at the next slide, uh, the, a reason that this isn't even the most accurate way to look at it. Uh, because really, construction emissions and, and operating emissions um, aren't, they don't, the lines don't cross like that. The emissions happen after you've already spent your embodied emissions. So your embodied emissions you spend first. And that's, that's when the project, when you open your doors to start operating the building, you've already spent all those emissions to build the building. So here's your standard building, 430 or 440 tons of embodied emissions and 1,600, almost 700 tons of operating emissions. So a total of just over 2,000 tons of emissions over 20 years. And if you look at our building, next slide, the building we built, we lowered both operating and embodied, and the total is almost cut in half. A lot of that came from the operating, uh, but quite a bit of it came from embodied. And if you go back to 10 years, the next 10 years, that little dotted line, it's about 50% is embodied and about 50% is operating. So if you're looking at how to reduce carbon impact quickly, we have to address embodied emissions as well as operating emissions. Next slide. So the significance of all this is that the next, which I just said, the next 20 years is really critical. So if you look at carbon reduction starting up on the left-hand upper corner, and you look at different scenarios, uh, if you look at just a steady state 10% reduction per year, that's the blue line. Everything under that blue line is the amount of carbon you will emit over time until you get to zero. If you start slow and then increase the rate of reduction, everything under the red line is the amount of carbon you emit. And if you start fast and decrease the rate of reduction, or continue, but even if you decrease it, everything under the green line is total emitted. So what this shows you is that the, the more you can do up front, uh, which is what embodied carbon is all about, the first thing you do in a building is you put that embodied carbon into it. If you can reduce that, uh, you're reducing the the total amount uh, over time. So that's really the, the reason to focus on embodied carbon is if you look at a 20 year time frame and you want to have a fast impact, you got to focus on embodied carbon as well as operating. So next slide, I think it's just about the end here. And this is really just some of the sources um, of where this data comes from. And the one that, the one that I highlighted is the one that I use the most, uh, which is the ICE database out of Bath, uh, England. Uh, there's some other, other systems that are very good that I didn't use very much. The analysis programs like, like Athena are difficult to use unless you're just evaluating sort of standard assemblies and standard buildings. And where our buildings are never very standard, so we, we couldn't find, couldn't make it work for what we were doing. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there, and I'm actually uh, not very good at using them all, so I just stuck with something that was a 
checklist that you could actually look up each material and use it. And it's not going to be 100% accurate, but it's good enough for the kind of analysis we're doing right now. So that's the end of my presentation, um, and I'm, I'll answer questions I guess at the end. Okay. So next slide I think is still mine, but it's just a filler slide, and then you can go to Ralph. Okay, there was one question that maybe we should um, answer now, and that is, okay. is, is the carbon the only metric recognized here? Well, it's the metric we're focusing on uh, for this study. We actually um, always focus on all the other metrics, uh, which which have to do with uh, habitat impacts, uh, water impacts, um, all kinds of things that I think are, are really important. Um, but but we were interested in seeing how big the carbon impacts were from building a building. Um, as I said in that earlier slide, you don't want to get stuck with thinking that carbon is always the most important metric to consider because there are some other issues. We use only FSC or reclaimed wood in our projects because we think the habitat impact of the way we're managing our forests are probably uh, at least as important as, as carbon impacts. Um, and it turns out that the way that you manage forests if you're not doing FSC has have larger carbon impacts. Uh, larger clear cuts have a bigger carbon impact than selective, for, selective forestry. So it all, it all kind of ties together. Or the fact if you're saving fresh water, uh, fresh water has a large energy and carbon impact too. So uh, in answer to your question, it's not the only metric you, we use. Uh, it's what this study was focused on, but it's not the only thing we considered at all. And you shouldn't. <laughs> Okay. All right. I um, we have brought up Ralph's um, presentation. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Burton Edwards. I'd like to give a uh, brief introduction for Ralph. Uh, at the conference in Santa Monica, uh, Nina Towering uh, presented this presentation uh, sort of on behalf of Ralph. They're both uh, work at Green Building Services in Portland. Uh, Ralph is a principal of Green Building Services and has a background that includes degrees in architecture and historic preservation. Uh, green Building Services provides leadership in all aspects of green buildings, and uh, they work on establishing sustainability goals, project management, building certification, uh, LEED and sustainability training, and also offer eco charrettes. Uh, in the past, Green Building Services has managed more than 5% of the total number of LEED certifications around the globe. Uh, I hope that number is still correct, Ralph, but that's what I got off your website. Yeah. Uh, Ralph himself provides project management and technical oversight for projects, uh, but also specializes in the training side of uh, GBS's practice. Uh, some of the information that Ralph is going to be showing today was part of a study sponsored by the National Trust for Historic Preservation on quantifying the value of existing buildings. In that study, they used a life cycle analysis to study six building types in four regions across the U.S. Uh, with the intent of uh, determining when it is preferable, and that would be sort of economically preferable, to reuse existing buildings versus replacing them with new construction. And that's a study that uh, is supposed to be released this fall in time for the National Trust Conference. Uh, and with that, I will turn this over to Ralph. Thank you, Burton. And the, the only thing I was going to just uh, uh, comment on that you just shared is it was the, the, the focus of the study is on the environmental benefits of reuse, not the economic benefits. And, and okay. so, um, and uh, Corrine, is this the updated presentation? Yes, it is. Okay. I'm going to, um, we don't have a whole lot of time, and I want to leave time for uh, questions and answers. So I'm going to probably move through the beginning portion of this uh, rapidly and, and try and get to the, the, the content. Um, so um, I'll cue you uh, to move forward. So uh, go ahead and advance the slide. So, you know, we know um, certainly that uh, we have a lot of existing buildings, and uh, the data that we have says uh, about 328 billion square feet of existing buildings in the U.S. And 
we often demolish existing buildings to build new buildings, and those new buildings may or may not have a lower um, operating impact, but there's also, as, as uh, Larry was pointing out, the uh, impacts of, of construction and the choices that we make. So there's, um, there, there's mainly three areas of focus, you know, the, the impact of operating a building, uh, demolishing a building, and, and new construction. Um, so this study is really, again, uh, trying to determine uh, uh, when is it environmentally favorable to reuse compared to build new. Um, and so uh, go ahead. Uh, and go ahead. And, you know, we know that, that usually existing buildings are, are already disadvantaged that, um, and I, I would just say, you know, some architects prefer kind of uh, to start from scratch, um, and, and uh, some architects specialize in reuse and some specialize in new construction. So their existing buildings are sometimes challenged in that way. Um, a lot of the industry is geared towards new construction rather than reuse. Economics of reuse can be challenging, and, and uh, that goes right down to that's a reuse project that rather than new construction. Go ahead. And the other thing that we're really challenged by is, is that we have uh, I think a predisposition to imagine sustainability as some kind of uh, uh, fantastic creation that that we can really build our way out of the environmental crisis that we have, uh, but we don't really know the facts between uh, that that tell us whether reuse is actually um, um, less harmful than new construction. And I think we, as a society, focus on new solutions to to uh, solve our climate crisis. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Um, so again, how can we compare? Go ahead. Um, I think this has all been shared already. Go ahead. Again. May I'll just say next. <laughs> um, so this is a research by the uh, US EPA, basically sharing that nearly 50% of all materials and products and services and resources uh, in the U.S. go to the new construction industry. And I would say, I would preface that by saying when um, we have economic good times, I would say right now that this, uh, this chart might be different given our current economic state. Next. Um, and in terms of the toxic the toxicity of products that we use that uh, you know nearly 20 percent of the uh, toxic uh, components of materials are um, based upon materials used for the new construction industry next um, and uh, you know the projections and this is a Brookings institution institution study that uh, basically within uh, you know by by 2030 we will have uh, perhaps demolish 27% of the existing building stock. So more than a quarter of our building stock will be demolished in the next, um, you know, uh, 30 years. Go ahead, 20 years. Next. Next. And so, you know, the, a lot of the focus on on retaining existing buildings has focused on the embodied energy of the existing buildings. Um, the, the language has really changed, and I think next, go ahead, um, there's a animation, that the energy expended in the past on, on building buildings is not something that we necessarily can take credit for. But what we can take credit for is the avoided impacts of new construction. And, and so by reusing existing buildings, we can basically take advantage of all of the impacts associated with what Larry was sharing, the, the structure, the envelope, and other components that have a heavy carbon burden, if we don't have to build those, if we can renovate an existing building, we get um, to take advantage of avoided impacts. Go ahead. So the language has changed in, in terms of um, how we... And there are a number of studies. This is the Empty Homes Agency, basically. It can take 35 to 50 years, basically, for a new building to 
the impacts of construction compared to an existing building or a renovated building. Go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, another study is sh showing that it would take about 82 years for a new green home to recover the carbon expended um, if, if it replaces an existing building. Next. 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 Okay. And next. Next. So, you know, and I think the numbers vary, again, depending on our economic situation. But, again, the, the vast majority of our efforts in terms of our economic engine um, and how much input, how much work we do in, in our uh, building industry is focused on new buildings. In fact, spending on new construction is double that of spending on, on renovation. And yet, you know, that is a very small portion of the total building stock, what, we, what our replacement rate is. And so it begs the question, if, you know, if we've got all of this building stock out there, should we be focusing more on renovation? Go ahead. So again, the statistics uh, that, that we have, 328 billion square feet. Next. And a lot of these being residential, um, single-family detached dwellings, uh, a vast majority of the building stock in the U.S. Next. And so as part of our study, what we, we first set out to do with the National Trust was to look at the total uh, building stock in the U.S. and determine what are the most pro predominant uh, building types. And so uh, education facilities, mercantile office, uh, and warehouse type buildings are the predominant building type by square footage. And so those were some of the buildings that we chose along with the single family and multifamily buildings to study with this uh, life cycle assessment. Next. And next. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, for instance, uh, total energy consumption of buildings by when they were built, on the residential side, uh, energy use has gone down over time. But with commercial buildings, the total energy use of um, uh, basically, the energy intensity of a building, how much energy a building uses per square foot per year, is uh, about on par with buildings that were built before 1920. So a, a, a most recently built building uh, operates at about the same efficiency as a, as a older building. So there's, a, again, the presumption, I think, among many people is that older buildings are less efficient. Um, and as Burton said, there's a question about what percentage of, so next slide, Sorry. Um, what percentage of the total impact of a building is related to its construction versus its uh, operations over time? And I think it's one of the important questions here is the assumption of how, how long a building might last and um, how efficiently it operates. And so those are two really important parts of the study that we're doing. Go ahead. Um, so we'll talk quickly about the methodology next. Again, the question, under what conditions is reuse environmentally favorable? Go ahead. Next. Um, so we basically did this uh, effort in, th in three parts, the, the research groundwork, the, the background that I just shared, scenario development, choosing the six building types, and then doing running the full LCA. Next. Next. So here are the six building types, uh, single family, residential, commercial office, multifamily, warehouse conversion to office, and um, multifamily residential. An urban kind of mixed use building, so a small uh, um, two to three story building and a, and a K through eight school. Next. Um, and here's an example of, of what we did. We, took uh, an existing building, uh, an existing building, in this case a residence, um, that was renovated. And we used the data that we had on the renovation to quantify materials. And then we took another example of a building that was uh, building being built, uh, so a new construction example, uh, 
and we use the quantification from that for materials quantities. So just showing the example of residential next. And using life cycle uh, assessment and, um, and this process of really understanding the full life cycle impacts from extraction, uh, transportation, manufacture, use, and end of life. Next. Next. So what we, what we did was we uh, are comparing basically the performance of a building using uh, energy performance as a sensitivity analysis. Um, existing, which would be approximately 30% less efficient than the baseline. The baseline has been derived by uh, various studies and uh, using the CBEX uh, Commercial Buildings Energy Consumption Survey and the Residential Energy Consumption Survey. And then what would happen if that building had a 30% energy improvement? And that's the basis. And we did this for both the um, new construction and the renovated building next. And we uh, tested for what impact um, building lifetime would have. So uh, if it was only a, uh, around for 25, 50, 75, or 100 years, next. And then we're also uh, comparing geographically based upon climate and also the uh, efficiency or the carbon impacts of the utility grid, next. next. And part of what our thinking was about is comparing, let's say, a baseline building that meets code to one that's more efficient and understanding that as we drive down operating impacts, um, we see more of a, a distinction between the impacts of new construction versus a rehabilitation. And so this is the theory behind the study. Next. Next. Okay, next. We'll just go ahead. So in, in, and one of the things that we did was develop a list of energy efficiency measures that could be applied to a building to bring it up to a code baseline versus a 30% improvement in energy performance. And, and we quantified those materials as part of the life cycle assessment for the study. Next. And I'm going to go through the LCA approach rapidly because we're rapidly running out of time. <laughs> so. Um, so again, just comparing new construction to rehabilitation, uh, kind of two separate tracks. Next. Next. We uh, excluded a number of factors in order to actually run the study. Next. And again, the sensitivity. Next. And, and basically, we were looking at uh, four different impacts. So uh, the impacts that are in the center of the circle, uh, using the impact 2002 plus um, uh, LCA methodology, basically, these are four ecosystem endpoints, um, or uh, different uh, environmental endpoints. So eco ecosystem quality, human health, uh, um, other uh, midpoints, for instance, climate change, um, and uh, resource impacts. And so we were looking at um, not just carbon or climate change, uh, but uh, other issues related to, for instance, uh, with human health, looking at uh, particulates and uh, ecosystem quality, aquatic uh, toxicology, et cetera. So, um, not, so, so really having a, a much broader look at um, uh, environmental impacts next. And so, again, our results are preliminary, and we are running final calculations as it is uh, right now. Next. Um, OK, next. And so the, the results as we're going to, and uh, I think click one more time, uh, as we're going to, um, and one more time share uh, when we get the uh, results finalized, and again, these are preliminary results, is that we're looking at, uh, for instance, resource impacts. And we can see in that an existing building uh, left as is has a lower impact than if we were uh, to um, have a baseline building or an improved building. So this, I think one, one thing that's important to note here, and, and the and RR is renovation and reuse, new, uh, NC is new construction, is um, that from a resource perspective, what we're finding is renovating a building has environmental impacts on resources. And that makes sense, because we're putting in uh, materials to renovate those buildings. 
um, the renovation has a lower impact than the uh, new construction does. Um, ecosystem quality and and the um, unfortunately we don't have the uh, what these bars are the uh, the bars the orange uh, part of the bar is uh, operating energy and the blue part of the bar is materials impacts. Um, so the uh, you can see in this case ecosystem quality uh, there's um, there's a uh, a greater impact associated with um, the new construction compared to renovation when it when it comes to the baseline or uh, improved uh, thirty percent. Next. Next. Okay. So um, so again, the preliminary results, um, and I think this is the, the, the this is the example that I really like to focus on. So for the commercial office building, when we're looking at climate change impacts, um, and again, the blue bar being the materials-related uh, impacts, and the uh, orange bar, the uh, operating energy impacts, um, that uh, that the there's a continuous improvement um, that happens in a commercial office building when we choose to upgrade a building to at least a code baseline. Um, and uh, or and and I think this is you know so the middle bars basically compare a renovation of a building that meets a code baseline versus a new construction building that meets a, ba a code baseline, and you'll see that basically it's mainly in the materials impacts. Uh, the columns on the right basically are showing that um, the uh, the climate change impacts of a building that uh, is renovated to be 30 percent better than the baseline that we have has much uh, dramatically lower uh, total impact and the renovation again is comparatively better than the new construction and fundamentally what this has to do with is the ability to reuse the superstructure of that building compared to the new construction building next and I think this is the important point is as, as uh, Larry was saying we're running out of time. Uh, next, that you know, we know that we we have a we have a very short window of time uh, to deal with climate change, and um, and we're seeing more and more impacts from climate change, and so um, I think this is one of the most interesting outcomes of the study. Next, is is this question? And I think it's what what um, you know, basically uh, Larry was saying or suggesting is if we look at uh, basically the, the climate change uh, impacts over time, um, that uh, you know, basically the, the, the lowest impact over time is renovating an existing building um, to be at least 30% more efficient uh, than, than a code baseline. And, um, and th there is this crossing point, and, and so if we look at basically uh, you know, if we look at that uh, yellow bar, the rehabilitated building that that meets um, kind of a the baseline uh, operating performance. Um, if we compare that to a new building that's 30 percent more efficient, it will take approximately 40 years for that new building to catch up from a carbon perspective. And so, it's a different way of looking at what what Larry was saying earlier. But the point is, is that um, that the renovated uh, example always is environmentally preferable. Um, even if a new building is more efficient, it will take a, a, a very long time for that new building to catch up. And if we don't have time, we, we can't extend that carbon. And so I think, as, as, as Larry pointed out, the, um, the major uh, carbon impacts of a new building happen uh, at the time of construction. And, um, and then operating efficiency takes a much longer time to catch up. And so, so I think that this is very telling about what the final results of the study will be next. Oh, and there's that, that crossover point. Next. So the, the whole goal of the study is, is basically to um, you know, uh, show the, the results of the life cycle assessment and uh, and clearly illustrate conditions under which reuse is favorable. Uh, and the what we're really looking to do is is to not only impact uh, practitioners but also impact policy, and and start to guide policy that uh, that gives more uh, favorable um, 
you know, incentives and, uh, and policy uh, uh, support for renovation and reuse based upon the environmental impacts um, associated with them. Next. And I think that's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Um, <clears throat> so what we are going to do now is um, open it up for questions. Um, if you have a question, um, please write it in the question box and um, we will ask our speakers um, to answer. Um, I know sometimes it takes a, a, a bit to um, write um, the um, questions, but um, one that we have says great present good presentation. Um, will the slides be available after the um, presentation. And yes, um, what I will do is I will send everybody um, a link um, with the, the slides. Okay, any other questions? And if you can't think of a question now, what um, we can always do is you can email me the question and I will be able to um, forward that on to um, our speakers. I could ask a question of Larry if there's no other questions. Sure. Okay. I want to do too, or else. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah, I want to do too, so go, go ahead. ahead. Um, so, you know, so I was I was curious, and I don't know if we can go back in the slides, but you know, um, I was just thinking from a perspective of showing showing the construction carbon along a hundred year timeline. What we were looking at, and I think this is the hard thing to really visually capture, is that really the construction carbon happens uh, before year one, right, or in year one, mm -hmm. and and then it drops. Right, so it doesn't go along on a straight line, um, you know. Uh, uh, and I think that that's one of the visually hard things to capture because if you can show real time, like on an annual basis, carbon. Uh, um, and I know what you're doing; you're kind of showing cumulative impact. Right. But but if you show real time impacts, uh, it's it's a very divergent looking uh, impact. And we've done this, and we're we're uh, we're trying to finalize these um, these diagrams, but. But really, what happens is you get a, a almost a two to one comparison of the renovation to the new construction in that year one, and then both of them drop off, and they eventually yeah. catch and they eventually catch up with each other, and um, and the operating energy, um, you know, theoretically gets close to the same. But it, but what it shows is that all of those impacts are early on, and and then the renovation, you know, ticks up every once in a while. So. No, that's that's a really good point. I you know I was trying to show that that wherever you start with your operating energy, um, yeah. you're always starting from having already expended that. So it was yeah. a baseline. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I also thought that it was interesting, and you did point it out. The expanded polystyrene is is such a uh, uh, surprising, uh, surprisingly impactful product, and and the other piece of it is, and you know, certainly worth mentioning is the climate change impacts of the the um, blowing agents. That, yeah, yeah. I was actually looking at that more in terms of its impact on climate than just yeah. than just CO two. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so one of the questions I had, and this isn't really a question for you, it's for for all of us, is sort of. More and more people seem pretty convinced that the solution to this is to work on uh, our existing buildings. In other words, not just not tear them down, but actually improve them. Right. And and how do we get that to happen? Because it feels like there's just so, as you say, there's so much inertia and there's so much of an industry built up around new construction. Yeah. Uh, I even I even found a chart buried in some government database that showed the number of construction companies doing renovations has been falling for the last 40 years. Yeah. So there's more people doing, or there's more volume, certainly, 
in new construction. How do you change that um, that mindset or that economic model? Because it feels like it's a big problem to try and even if when people right. get it, they need to be doing that. How do we make it happen? Well, I think my you know my take on this as we've been thinking about it is that. You know, if, if most buildings are built by developers or, you know, um, uh, institutions and they, and they all run pro formas, uh, nowhere in the pro forma is there any line item associated with climate change or habitat loss or any of those things. And so I, I, I guess what I would argue is that if our paradigm is associated with, you know, a pro forma that has, uh, you know, a, a financial uh, outcome, that we have to monetize these environmental impacts, and whether it's you know monetizing carbon or monetizing more than that uh, is really is really key. And I think you know the easy answer is you know uh, the carrots and the sticks. So you know you basically regulate new construction, uh, you incentivize renovation, and 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 therefore you kind of flip the ec economics. In a way, and it's, it's a lot of people would say, well, that's not a very market-based solution. But, but really, the externalities of environmental impact are not, you know, how are we going to start to internalize those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did, did your study look at any? I mean, there's a lot of discussion going on about net zero energy buildings, uh, and most of yours seem to sort of cap out at 30 percent improvement. Right. The only justification I have anymore for building a new building is if you start out with a net zero energy building. So at least there still is initial impact, but from day one, there's no other impact. Right. Well, uh, we, and I, I mean, just, yeah. I mean, I, we looked at it initially, and and what we decided is that so many, you know, to get beyond the thirty percent, a lot of it has to do with things that you would do to either a renovation or a new construction building, and um, and that, you know. I, we'll, we're, we're still pretty far away from all buildings being net zero energy buildings, and so we wanted to make something, you know, that um, demonstrate something that really is readily applicable today. And we really right. believe that a 30% reduction for either a new construction or a renovation is is very reasonable. Um, but we right. you know, we acknowledge that um, you know occupant behavior, um, operating uh, um, standards for a building, schedules, maintenance, all of those things. Um, could impact either a renovation or a new construction building. And, and those are the things that would get you to 40, 50, 60 percent reduction or, or more. Right. And, and then the other thing that I'd love to explore uh, in this, because just because there's so much interest right now in, in net zero, is uh, how much more difficult, or is it more difficult, to achieve net zero in an existing building versus a new building? And it sort of seems obvious that it would be harder, but I know people that have done net zero energy renovations. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I think people tend to say, oh, well, we can't get to net zero if we're saving the building. And I think that's not true. And it'd be nice if there was some, uh, there's not a lot of examples, but it'd be great to have some strategies for showing that that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it starts with that whole point that those buildings don't really necessarily perform any any worse than any other building out there, and and that we know that we have other benefits. Like many of them are built to, to do daylighting well, and they've got good thermal mass, and um, they're good for natural ventilation. And so I think you know we we I think we need to basically you're right that we need good case studies that share how uh, how possible it is. Um, there is I, I know there is one GSA building that they're doing a, a net zero historic building as a kind of a large commercial building. And so um, so I think we'll see more more of those coming up. Right, right. I think that's going to be critical to show people that it's, that it's doable. And I think in the, in the historic community, there's worries about taking an old building, even if it performs well for daylighting or thermal mass, it may be a very leaky building. Uh, and how do you take an old shell and, and tighten it up to get to these sort of High performance passive house standards without um, impacting possibly the materials and the way the building, the, the historic nature of the building. So that those are trickier problems, maybe. But yeah. yeah. Well, we're seeing more of an interest in um, you know thermal imaging and blower door testing, and and I think that we're going to 
get to understand more that, you know, I think the most important thing about understanding a historic building or an existing building is understanding what an influence infiltration has or um, the loss through the envelope. Um, and, you know, I think we just jump to conclusions and I think maybe our assumptions are not always right. So, so a really thorough assessment of an existing building is the first step, right? And then, and then uh, attacking those issues as you find out what's most, most pressing. Yeah, so, I think that's really true. Um, because that, that when I did an assessment of my house, the first thing I learned was that the single largest item was infiltration. Yeah. Than, I don't even have ins, I don't have insulated walls, but that was still lower than the infiltration loss yeah. that I had. Yeah. Just perfect because the walls aren't insulated. And and we don't do. I mean, I I know in other like in Europe and England, uh, they they do blower door testing on large commercial buildings. It's something we're not doing here as a as a matter of course, and I think it's something we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of uh, more questions. Um, one is, since it is possible to calculate construction emissions, why do you think that it is not part of the BAAQMD requirements for GH GHG emissions analysis? Uh, well, I'll take a stab first. I, I think it's possible, but it's still not easy. And I think um, there are people more sophisticated than than I in terms of how to uh, how to do this more simply. And one of the one of the tools that I think will be used commercially is is in uh, building integrated modeling building systems where you actually can start to enter the materials in your building as you go along and and then pull out all those quantities which I had to do by hand and feed it into an Excel spreadsheet with that's already got the, uh, the that's already got the, the, the carbon equivalents, the carbon emissions associated with those materials. It, it's, um, it's until pretty recently that the data has not been very available and very reliable and I think it's getting more reliable and more available and I think people also worry too much about um, if it's not exactly accurate, they don't want to use it, where most of the data I've seen isn't exactly accurate because it's all site specific or manufacturing specific, but it's good enough. And I think people have to get over this, um, this uh, worry about accuracy and just accept them with a, a margin of error. Uh, I, I think it will be, I think we will be seeing this more. But even in, even in California's AB32 bill, I haven't yet seen, although I've talked to some of the people running that program, I haven't yet seen anybody take me into account that they have to count embodied carbon, too. Um, it's got to happen. I would, I, I would agree. I mean, I think, I think it has to do with the, the kind of lack of um, maturity of our, our, the data that we have and the tools that we have to use to do these calculations. No. And um, another question is, um, do the speakers have any suggestions on how to basically package the information simply so the public can digest it? Because some of these uh, concepts are really um, difficult um, and um, may not be so easy to take in. Well, I guess I, I would... Uh, say on, on our behalf, uh, the idea of our study is that ultimately uh, we, we will have a full detailed um, scientific study, but we're also working on a report that will be much more approachable um, to illustrate the outcomes of this um, this study. And so, uh, so again, w once we get this completed, you know, our, our goal is to have a much more kind of approachable um, uh, um, study that's easily digested and understood. And yeah, for me, I don't. I, I guess the only thing is that um, we, we've done some little short articles. We did an end, a rear view end piece uh, article on this at the back of Green Source Magazine a few months ago. Um, it's just one page long. It sort of covers these basic concepts. I think that the thing that gets complicated about um, about embodied carbon uh, 
Operating carbon is then sort of the purview of our mechanical engineers. We've let them deal with it. And this is one that belongs to the architects and the materials suppliers and the specifiers because uh, and it, it, it's something we're not used to doing. Um, but, but 10 years ago, we weren't used to looking at other environmental attributes, the building materials, green attributes, and now we're doing that. I think we just have to, um, we have to educate ourselves to be able to make smart choices. And, and I think we, we have to learn sort of the, like I said in one of the slides, the low-hanging fruit. We have to focus on the things that matter the most in reducing um, embodied carbon in the materials. And I think that the simplest thing is to say, not build new buildings. I mean, the simplest thing is just not to use the materials and to use fewer of them and to use them more efficiently. Um, so I think that it's a, the simple answer is to, is to really go to fixing up old buildings rather than building new ones. But since we're still going to build new buildings, then the next thing gets, it gets more complicated. And you have to simplify and prioritize uh, what your choices are in, in making low carbon selections of your materials. It's not really that difficult, but you do have to educate yourself some. So and another question that we had is uh, you discussed the uh, you discussed milling the lumber on the Portola Valley project and milling the wooden crates. Did you look at the GHG impact and cost of the the milling process itself and the um, GHG impact of getting the millers to the wood or the wood to the millers? Yes, we, we did not quantify it. We did look at it and consider it. It's, it's a very small impact. The, the millers that we used uh, were all within about 30 miles of the site. Some of them were within six miles of the site. So the, the greenhouse gas emissions for transportation were so minimal that um, we didn't calculate it. We could have, but it would have been far less than one ton. We were dealing in tons. Um, and the milling equipment itself is, these are small scale operations. These aren't big lumber mills. It's a little uh, bandsaw, basically. Um, so the, the milling impacts are pretty low. The, the higher impacts from processing wood actually come from the kiln drying processes. And this is already dry old lumber, so we're not dealing with that again. Um, so in answer, we did not quantify it, and we estimated it as a very low impact. And, and if we had more time, we'd probably quantify every impact, and we'd put a number to that. But it's pretty, it's pretty negligible in terms of uh, the 16 tons we saved, for instance, in, in using those site salvage materials for transportation. Uh, the transportation we expanded, moving those materials to a miller and back was probably far under one ton. So I don't see it as a big impact. And another question we had, do you think it would be feasible to implement development fees for new construction that could then be used to renovate existing buildings and make them more energy and make them energy efficient? You want to check that one, Ralph? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. It's, uh, do you think um, there's a possibility of implementing development fees for new construction that could be used to renovate existing buildings? Yeah, I think that was, I mean, that's part of my point, and that's a very specific policy recommendation. I think, I think that what we want to do with the study is, is point out that there need to be some policy mechanisms that encourage renovation. And certainly, one of the things I've heard is, uh, you know, is it possible to do things like accelerated depreciation on renovation compared to new construction, or permitting fees would be another one. And I think that the most challenging thing will be that there's going to be a lot of pushback from those in the construction industry that are focused on new construction. And um, there's, so, so I, I guess my short answer is yes. I think that sounds like a, a great policy concept. I just think it would be very, very hard. I think there needs to be a complete paradigm shift in the in the building industry. Which which may come by on its own because there's not a lot of new construction happening now. So yeah. some of these 
Yeah. Some of these people are already looking at renovations as another market. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, this is uh, more of a comment rather than a question, but maybe um, the speakers are familiar with it. Energy Upgrade California has rejected the Sonoma County pilot's effort to incorporate preservation concerns in their program and training, which of course is disappointing. Um, are you familiar with that? I'm not. No, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know the specifics of that, but one of the one of the issues I think that um, we've presented something similar to this twice at the last uh, California Preservation Conference. And one of the points we're making is we're talking to the preservation community, but what we're really talking about is all existing buildings. And so, yeah, I think that the issue is not to just say the historic buildings are worth saving. We have to figure out a way to save them all and improve them all. And so I think if you limit it too much, or if it feels like you're just talking about historic buildings, you're only talking about a small percentage of the buildings that have to be saved. And the challenge for architects is to figure out, everyone wants to work on a cool old brick mill building and convert it into lofts or something. I mean, that's a beautiful project, but what about a concrete tilt-up Safeway? You know, I, we have to figure out how to use our talent to transform the mundane built environment uh, and upgrade it at the same time. And I think that's a, that's a much bigger challenge. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And I think that the, the um, you know, the study that the National Trust uh, is, is uh, sponsoring is very much, I would say, a, a new direction for the trust. And the study is, it's about all existing buildings. It's not about historic buildings. And I think that there's a, a, a strong push among some preservationists to broaden the, um, the purview of preservationists because it, it helps to gain a much uh, wider audience. And so I always see preservationists as experts in existing buildings and that preservationists could really leverage that expertise to say, you know, we are the experts in the built environment and, uh, and we know that preserving existing buildings, reusing them has a much lower environmental impact and really not uh, act in an adversarial way to folks focused on green building uh, and environmental sustainability, but really becoming an advocate and, and saying, you know, we will preserve existing buildings and historic buildings because it's, it's better for the environment, it's better for the community. Um, you know, and the Safeway example is a great one because just a couple of blocks from my house, they demolished an existing Safeway. They excavated for a basement, and they're and they're building with a lot of concrete. So, just you know, your point, Larry. It's 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 what we do. We demolish buildings and we build new ones, and we need to be much more resourceful with with reuse. And I think the other thing about this is that it's, it's never going to be a case of no more new buildings. Yeah. So I think the other piece of this puzzle that we started to quantify in our study was. If you can't reuse the building, reuse the materials. You know, but we need to develop a large um, infrastructure for salvaging and reusing materials more efficiently than we're doing it now. Absolutely. And if you're going to build a new building and you don't have an existing building, use salvage materials. Exactly. Yeah. Because it really does. It really does lower your impact, and we were able to sort of quantify some of that. Well, we're getting towards the um, end of our presentation, so I just want to take this time to go ahead and thank our moderator, Burton Peak Edwards, and our speakers, Larry Strain and Ralph Danola. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar, and as I mentioned before, I will be uh, sending these slides of the presentations out to everybody. And um, if you um, have any other questions that you'd like our speakers to answer, feel free to email us at cpf um, at californiapreservation.org. And um, other than that, thank you very much for joining the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.